everybody. Welcome to the bonus content of Workforce, a podcast that brings behavioral science insights and work insights to tell you what's going on in your workplace and why. I spoke to Kelly Swingler about corporate Stockholm syndrome, and she is the expert on burnout. So I couldn't resist asking her about what corporate Stockholm syndrome does to people. And sure enough, we ended up talking about toxic workplaces and burnout, and she has some great insights and some great advice. Let's listen to what she has to say. Right. So Stockholm syndrome really is, um, you know, when we when we stay in in a place that is is too toxic for too long um, and we can in some places then kind of start to start to fall in love with it, can't we? So, um, yeah, it can be very, um, very harmful, very hurtful. Um, can have a very, very long lasting impact on on everybody that, that stays in that situation. But yeah, ultimately, it is uh, this toxicity in, in the workplace. And um, I was shocked, actually, I, I reached out, I, I had my own opinions as to what we'd be talking about today, and then reached out to my network to ask for their experiences about these toxic workplaces, uh, corporate Stockholm syndrome. And I was shocked by the amount of people actually that are still very much in toxic workplaces, uh, experiencing the issues in toxic workplaces. And um, yeah, some, some of the, the stories that I, I kind of received actually were, were quite heartbreaking. So you mentioned love, Kelly. So when I think about corporate Stockholm syndrome, I think there's, I imagine two types of people. The first group who rationalize staying, so they recognize yeah. that it's toxic. Maybe some of yeah. your, maybe, maybe some of your network were like that. They recognize it's toxic, but there's reasons why they stay. And the second, then, which is another step, that that they are in love with all or some part of the the job. So, can you help people understand how it actually occurs that you end up in that situation? Yeah, I think I suppose if if I kind of draw on draw on some of my own experience, really, I think for those of us, um, and my, so my, my background is is very much in HR. I was I was an HR director, uh, worked in HR for a very very long period of time, and and um, as I said just before we came on live, I I did a talk on Friday to an HR audience, and and I was speaking to an HR audience the week before. There is something in certainly HR as a profession, I'm sure many other professions as well, was actually it is the it's almost the toxicity, it's almost the challenge that drives us to go to work for those organisations in the first place. Like if you offered me as an HR director a kind of housekeeping type role that where there were no issues, no challenges, I could just go in and everything was really smooth sailing. Actually, that might be a job that I would avoid because I, I, I just think I'd get really bored in that kind of environment. Whereas actually, if I've got an agency or a headhunter that are talking to me about this really challenging workplace, there is some toxicity, there's some culture change that needs to happen, there's leadership development, there's all of this stuff. Actually, that's the stuff that quite excites me as a professional going in, because actually, you know, I I very much saw my role as in-house as as being able to kind of turn those organisations around and, and make this big difference. So it's almost like you kind of know what you're walking into, and then actually, whilst you're in it, certainly from my experience, I didn't, although I knew and I'd been told it would be a challenge, I hadn't realised just how toxic it would be whilst I was actually in there. But there was still this driving part of me that thought, I, I can turn this around, I can make the change. And I think that's what it's like for many people, particularly if we are, you know, really, we've been recruited, we've been employed to to go in and help fix it. We almost become obsessed then with the toxicity and everything that we can do to, to try and turn it around. Is there ever a denial, Kelly, in some senses where, so I know um, uh, somebody who was really impacted by sexism in their workplace and they really refused to recognize that it was actually sexism because almost like it was a failure for them as an individual to be subjected to sexism and they did not necessarily want to kind of uh, confront that about themselves so it felt like they were taking the blame almost for the treatment that that they were getting so when we when we think about things like sexism homophobia racism to experience it is devastating Mm -hmm. and maybe it's difficult to accept that 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 causes people to stay in situations that they should ultimately leave yeah, I mean, and again, we we make excuses for it. Um, I I do think actually, since everything that started from from twenty twenty, I do think those things are coming to the forefront a lot more. People are calling it out. People are highlighting it much sooner, and are definitely talking about it. And we we're seeing that people are not staying in those sorts of environments. 
um, for for as long or they're just leaving as, as soon as they witness it. So in some ways, I think that has been a very, a, you know, a, a much needed shift because for myself and many other people that I know, we've definitely stayed there for too long. But yeah, we, you know, you you don't want to believe really that you have put yourself in that situation or you excuse you know, the, the types of behaviours from people, you know, if, if you had said something off the cuff, um, I might be, well, you know, maybe like, what, what, what's wrong with Grace today? Like, maybe, maybe Grace has just got an issue. Maybe she didn't really mean it that way. Did I hear it correctly? Um, did I take it the wrong way? And very often, absolutely, yes, we put a lot of the blame on us. And some of that, I think, does come from almost kind of disbelief. Like I genuinely can't believe that somebody would have said that or somebody would have acted acted that way. So maybe I I over exaggerated. That that tends to be a, a very common uh, common trait and and common behaviour for, for lots of people, I think. Yes. And and I think for others that do witness it all the time, they are then able to almost dismiss it as that's just one thing that happens, it's isolated in that part of the business or it's isolated from that particular person. Whereas if I look at everything else, you know, if we were to look at a toxic relationship, for example, many people stay in toxic relationships because the toxicity is almost off balanced by all of the other lovely stuff that's happening. So we tend to start to look for more of the lovely stuff rather than the toxic stuff that, that we're witnessing. Um, something that you were uh, saying reminded me of, of of intent and there does seem to be an increase in companies that have toxic environment issues where they always lean on intent and they always say well it did happen but the person didn't mean it even yeah. if that person has repeatedly done the same thing over over yeah. and over again and you know i I, I think we have to often assume good intent because people don't usually go out to hurt each other. But it does feel for me, it's like the new virtue signaling. Well, if something goes wrong, we'll just say that it was positively intentioned and then it, the person's off the hook straight away. Totally. I mean, I've, I've said throughout my, my entire career, I genuinely do not believe that anybody wakes up in the morning and thinks, you know, I'm going to go and insult as many people as I possibly can today, or I'm going to go to work, and I'm going to be the worst possible leader, or I'm going to go and be the worst possible colleague. I genuinely do not believe that anybody wakes up with that, you know, I'm going to go and cause as much destruction and damage as, as I can. I do think we see, you know, a lot of fear in organisations. I think we see a lot of fear from colleagues. And, and I think, uh, you know, it's it, uh, leaders that allow this type of behavior to continue are, are doing exactly that. They are basically saying that it's okay for you to behave in that way. And then, yeah. and therefore it does continue to happen. And yes, I absolutely, as I said, I don't believe that anybody goes out to be malicious with it, but I think the more that they are let off the hook, the more they think it's okay to say that. And, you know, sexist jokes, racism jokes, banter, you know, it's all of those things. It's just, well, you know, but, but I didn't mean it. And I think, again, what we witness is it is it is insulting. And I do think for some people it is genuinely what they think, be it about sex, be it about race, be it about religion, be it about what, whatever it may be. I do think some people do genuinely mean that and that maybe whether that is bias or unconscious bias or maybe just their view but again we brush it under the carpet as banter um without really understanding the impact on everybody in that situation